if you were to try and capture the Renaissance and freeze it into one frame, there is no more iconic painting than that of the School of Athens by Raphael. There is no shortage of mathematicians, astronomers and great thinkers in this painting, of which two philosophers are central, Plato and Aristotle. They are pinned against each other, each representing their own philosophy. On the left side, Plato is pointing his hands up in reference to his theory of forms, that our world is merely a shadow of an ideal world in which all forms are perfect and on which everything else is dependent, whereas on the right side, Aristotle's hand is down, insinuating that there is only one reality, a reality in which everything we come to learn and understand is a product of our perception and empirical senses. It is then no coincidence that both philosophers have a differing view of poetry. Plato is known for his dislike for poetry, because it doesn't deal with the truth, but rather faulty illusions. In his world, poetry is an imitation of an imitation. This is something that Philip Sidney addresses in his Defense of Poetry. In fact, one thing that Plato, Aristotle, and Sidney have in common is that they all believe that poetry is a form of imitation although with drastically different connotations. In Plato's Republic, poetry and poets have no place in his ideal world, but in Aristotle's Poetics, he notes that imitation, then, is one instinct of our nature. He calls it mimesis. As Sidney notes in his defense, poesy, therefore, is an art of imitation, or so Aristotle terms it in his word mimesis. That is to say, a representing, counterfeiting, or figuring forth. To speak metaphorically, a speaking picture with this end to teach and delight. Sidney uses three synonyms to try and capture the kind of imitation poetry expresses, being careful that none of these imply copying directly. He talks about poetry that represents something in nature and counterfeiting it, not as a means of achieving a replica, but rather replacing the original. Not only that, but figuring forth or in other words, going beyond that of the original. And by doing that, the poet creates an aspect of nature separate from itself, bringing about what might be a better nature or something else entirely different. That is indeed one of Sidney's first arguments, as he tries to answer, what value does poetry provide? Sidney notes poetry's historical significance, that among all nations, preceding any great minds, Poetry has been the first life giver to ignorance. He describes poetry as a first nurse, who nurtured our frail minds little by little in order for us to grasp tougher knowledges. The comparison of philosophy, history, and poetry has been brought up by all three figures. And although poetry does not hold as high of a place for the two philosophers, Sidney maintains that even the philosophers of ancient Greece operate under the mask of poetry. For every insight or wisdom they impart, although at heart philosophical, it still wears the beauty of poetry as its skin. Sidney acknowledges the capacity for philosophy and history to teach, but they fall short to poetry in that they do not inspire nor delight in the same way. Sidney asserts that the historian is too concerned with how things are or were. They do not have the same liberty as a poet to describe things as how they may be or should be. Historians are too occupied with the particulars, while the poets are with the universal. That is something that Aristotle maintains as well. Whereas for philosophy, Sidney concludes, The philosopher teacheth, but he teacheth obscurely, so as the learned only can understand him. That is to say, he teacheth them that are already taught. And that is where poetry supersedes philosophy and history in means of education or as Sidney describes it, a moderator between the two, as it combines the is and the ought with the maybe and should be, while making it palpable for those who aren't as learned. Although poetry is faced with a couple of charges, there is one in particular that Sidney takes most issue with, and it is that poetry is the mother of all lies, because poetry, according to Plato, does not deal with truths. Sidney is aware that he is defending fiction, but on the other hand, he believes that facts are giving too much privilege, that the literalism of the academic disciplines can ironically betray and deceive, unlike his quote-unquote fiction. He then supplements his claims by saying, Of all the writers under the sun, the poet is the least liar. For the poet, 
he nothing affirmeth, and therefore never lieth. For as I take it, to lie is to affirm that is to be true, which is false. Which is an odd the fact that what historians claim as true is in fact hearsay, while the philosophers deal in the extremities of absolute truth and morality.